And it doesn't have to have a name. It doesn't have to have rules. Um, it's just yeah. the things that are supporting me personally. So welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Jeannie Dubon, a movement therapist who specializes in hypermobility, EDS, and chronic pain. And today I'm delighted to welcome our expert uh, patient, Laura Fregno. And Laura is a mother who lives in Montreal, Canada with her partner and two children. She was first suspected to have a connective tissue disorder in 2016. However, she and her son are still waiting for a genetics consultation to confirm whether it's HSD or HEDS. She also has a primary immune deficiency and an episodic movement disorder that affects her speech. Laura is an occupational therapist working part-time with children. The support of her therapy team and tools like the Zebra Club have been instrumental in supporting Laura to reach her goals, especially in her role as a parent. So welcome, Laura, and thank you again for taking the time to speak to us today. Really Hi, Jeannie, I'm really, it. I'm happy to be here. No, oh, it's a delight to have you. It's always great to hear from sort of guest expert patients um, who are living with a chronic illness, because obviously helping to get those stories out when, you know, so many of our stories are unheard. So thank you so much. Um, so can you tell us about your health journey and how you sort of things started to appear for you at what age and you know what's been going on? Mm -hmm. So I was always a bit of the, the sickly child. Uh, so I have I have four siblings, um, or three siblings rather, we're, we're four. Um, and I was always the one who caught every cold that had every infection that the only one with food allergies, um, Yes. The only one with seasonal allergies or asthma. Um, I had multiple surgeries as a child to treat my ear infections and sinus infections. And so there have always been infections and weird rashes and odd pains that have been part of my life story from birth onwards. Yes. Um, and so when I first recognized that as being something else, something that was a little bit more significant than just being a little bit more sickly was yes. when I was in university, I think. Right. Be self-aware and recognize that people around me don't seem to be struggling as much as I am, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of managing their fatigue, um, of, managing, um, of managing illness in general. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it wouldn't be rare for someone to get one or two infections throughout um, throughout a school year with the stress yes. of exams and midterms and things. Yeah. But I, I just seem to have an infection all the time. I seem to be going to a walk-in clinic all of the time um, to get a prescription for one thing or another. If it wasn't my respiratory tract, it was my teeth. If it wasn't my teeth, it was other like skin infections and things. Um, so that was really what started me looking for answers and recognizing the things about me that were different from others. Yes. Um, and then that sort of led me to asking questions about my neurological symptoms. Yes. So asking questions about why, um, you know, when I'm looking at a computer screen for too long, I will see the backlight of the computer screen in my field of vision for sometimes hours afterwards. Wow. Um, and that my, my eyes were so sensitive to light that my, yeah. um, that I would see those sort of halos that as though I had looked straight at the sun. Yes. No, I understand. Um, yes. And Gosh. so I would see those for, for such a long time after looking at, at something that was backlit. And I, um, sometimes it would be like I was walking around the world with, uh, in a 3D movie without my 3D glasses on. Yeah. So everything sort of was fuzzy and had this weird outline and, um, so I had these weird visual symptoms. I had uh, numbness and tingling in my hands and feet. Um, and just this, um, I became uncoordinated very easily and, and at random times. Mm -hmm. So at one time I would be doing these sports drills and shining. And then the next moment, like just trying to put the cutlery away in the drawer, I was dropping things all over the place. Yeah. So it wow. just seemed to be coming in these weird episodes. Yes. 
Um, and I started to ask questions. And because of the ha family history of MS, I had right. my first MRI a bit over a decade ago. Yes. That came back clear. So I was told there was no problem. And I should go home. And I was fine. Right. So okay. I did my own research at that point, And I was like, okay, well, a lot of people who have early MS, it doesn't necessarily show up in an MRI. I'm not, I'm not in trouble right now. I'll wait it out. I'll keep yeah. an eye on things. I'll wait it out. Um, I waited it out. I uh, graduated from university. I started working two jobs. And then again, the symptoms became so severe. I was losing my balance. I started getting really bad brain fog. I started having bladder symptoms as well that I would just evacuate randomly, mm -hmm. uh, which that, that I had a hard time when people tried to tell me that that was normal. Yes. Um, and Gosh. so I went and got my, my second MRI. And when those results came back as normal, I was told that I had conversion disorder. Um, okay. and that I, I did take seriously for a little while. So conversion yeah. disorder is my neurologist, as my neurologist explained to me, yes. there may have been a trauma that I wasn't even aware of that had caused um, just a functional difference in my brain that was manifesting that psychological trauma as these physical symptoms that I was feeling. I see. Okay. And I, I had a really hard time with that because I didn't identify as anyone who had had any trauma in their life that I grew up in a very loving, connected family. I grew up in a very like uh, an amazing, quiet suburb. Um, I hadn't had any sort of negative traumatic experiences in my life that I could connect to that. Yes. But of course they covered their bases by saying it might be something that you don't even remember mm -hmm. that you've covered up because it's such a deep trauma. Yeah. And so um, I went looking for, um, I wasn't offered any psychological help at that time. I was dismissed from his office without any networking to any services. Wow. So I was sick enough to order the MRI, but I wasn't sick enough to be offered any help in, in my functioning, nice. um, which was pretty distressing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I tried to take that seriously. And I sat with that conversion disorder for a little while. I wanted to be open with it. I didn't have that understanding of the history of conversion disorder that I have now. Um, in that conversion disorder is directly related to hysteria. Um, and the, the evolution is that hysteria became conversion disorder. Mm -hmm. All of that medical bias that went yeah. into hysteria yes. is now carried through to that diagnosis. Right. And so I don't think that the, the neurologist was trying to be malicious in any way. I just think he wanted me to understand that there was nothing wrong. Yeah. Um, okay. and I, I was very lucky that I went out and I, um, I found a psychologist who I wanted to work with so that he could show me how I was doing this to myself. Yes. So, um, when I got into his office, he was an amazing man and he, really took me by the hand and, and explained to me that it was not my fault and that we are operating in this medical system that doesn't know how to say, I don't know. Yes. And because of that, we're going to face these barriers and we are going to face these diagnoses that are inappropriate because they just don't know. And there's yes. so much about the body that they don't know. Absolutely. And there's so much about the body that we're learning all the time. Like what we're, what's going on right now with fascia, I think yeah. it's going to, open the door up to a number of, of chronic diseases and pain conditions. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we, we discovered a new salivary gland last year by accident mm -hmm. with the, in our own mouths. We didn't yeah. know that there was a different salivary gland until last year. So yeah. there's so much about our bodies that we don't understand. And he sure. really helped me to, um, to become my own advocate and to learn how to operate in a system that didn't know what to do with me. And that really provided me with a, a very strong foundation. And he taught me a lot of meditative techniques. Um, we did, um, we started doing tapping together, which is something yes. that I continue to do today. Right. Um, and we, we did a lot of investigation of what is under my control and what is not under my control. 
and where I'm talking a lot about my satisfaction and where I can intervene with myself in order mm-hmm. to be satisfied with, with my functioning and with what I'm able to achieve. Yes. Um, and part of that is changing my perspective. And part of that is giving myself the tools that I need to do what I need to do. Yes. And so when was this, Laura? When did you? So this, this was, this, this is about five years ago. Okay. So this was when my neurological symptoms were really at their peak. Um, and in terms of just the, the numbness and tingling, the yes. brain fog, the coordination issues. Um, and this is also when the joint pain started. So I went to see him when the joint pain started and I thought that this was a new uh, manifestation of my conversion disorder. Um, and the joint pain started when I was in, um, when I was in school as a occupational therapy student. Okay. Um, and the joint pain was so variable and so widespread. It was mostly my small joints, but then it was also my larger joints. And then these headaches would come on that were, you know, tension headaches that yeah. we were told are sure. completely normal. Yeah. Um, so that he helped me get ready to go and do the antibody testing um, and to sort of face the, the doctor's appointments and the waiting for test results and things like that again. Mm-hmm. So I went through the entire autoimmunity panel looking for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or lupus yep. and... Yes. Uh, that all came back clear. So at that point I was diagnosed with inflammatory polyarthritis and I was put on Arthrotech, which is a a considerably toxic um, uh, anti-inflammatory that shouldn't be taken, um, that shouldn't be taken by fertile women, which I I learned later on. have to be on birth control when you're taking this pill because it can cause serious um right. serious birth defects and so when i wasn't feeling better and i was in fact feeling worse i started looking at that and like wondering like was this pill even tested in women my age because it's an arthritis pill mm-hmm. was uh, how how well was this tested for me because i started having issues with my cycle at that time as well so we discontinued that medication um, pretty quickly actually ended up going back to that rheumatologist and he took away the diagnosis of inflammatory polyarthritis um, and just said that I had joint pain and that was it. So it's always, it's been this very strange loop of having these wonderful doctor's appointments where I get taken in and they hear all my symptoms and then this blood work comes back and there's nothing in the blood work and okay. Yeah, they kind of, they don't know what to do, do they? It's like, yeah, they don't know what to do and they choose to do nothing. Yeah. Or they I mean, choose to assign you a pill and give you infinite repeats and they never want to see you again. Yes. I think that's um, one of the most things, isn't it? Because we're so desperate for answers. Okay. And you've been on a long journey seeing lots of different people and we're just so desperate. We just want someone to say, you've got this and this is what you do about it you know, even with a condition like EDS where there is no cure, but this is how you can manage it. But when they say, your blood works fine, you're good, you're going to be just fine. And then you're like, well, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. And then there's there's the social tension that goes with that yeah. as well, because everybody in your life knows that you've just gotten these tests done. Everybody knows that you have this appointment because it's so important to you. Yeah. And you, you sit there with your fingers crossed that maybe it is lupus because then there's there's an ending and the, the yes. appointments thereafter are going to have this this title card over them that yeah. I am a lupus patient or I am an RA patient where I can say like, this is me, here's our starting point. Yeah. Um, and I didn't get that starting point until last year. Um, okay. So up until 2019, I was just still this randomly sick woman with a various installation of uh of symptoms that mm-hmm. didn't quite fit in anything and there was nothing in my blood work yes so the the second turning the first turning point for me was meeting this therapist who really helped bolster my mental health as i yes. as i ran through the medical system and then the second turning point was i started working with a functional medicine practitioner in mm-hmm. montreal yeah so he worked at an integrative medicine clinic 
Um, and it was all private. So we, we funded it with myself and, and with help from family as well. Um, and he ran every test in the book. And he was able to say, I don't know what's wrong with you, but we're going to take a look at everything we can look at. And we are going to help build up your health from every angle that we can. Mm -hmm. So he was able to discuss things with me like movement and exercise, like sleep. Um, diet was a very big part of, of his treatment recommendations. And he, um, he also looked at what supplements would fit well with my chemistry yes. from what he, he got back with the test as well. So we tested yeah. for my vitamin deficiencies and all of my minerals and all of my electrolytes and all those things. And we were able to tailor my, my supplements exactly to what yeah. I needed. Yes. And um, from there, he was the one who first recognized that I had hypermobility. So he was the first one to do the bait and score with me. And when he did the bait and score and it came out as four, he asked me the follow-up questions and he asked me about my other joints. So I was able to demonstrate to him that because my bait and score might be four, but my hips are hypermobile, but my shoulders yeah. are hypermobile yeah. um, and my toes are hypermobile. It's just my, my knees and elbows and my yeah. pelvis are so locked. Yes. that I don't have hypermobility in those joints anymore. I actually have yeah. restricted movement in those yeah. joints now. But if you look at my, if you look at my muscles, they're, they're just locked. So um, he was able to recognize that. He referred me to rheumatology and the rheumatologist that I saw at first informed me that he could send me to genetics, but there wouldn't be a point because for genetic heritable conditions, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And at that point, I believed him. And again, so I left his office that like, okay, I probably have a heritable connective tissue disorder. Fine. There's not much you can do about it aside from what I'm already doing in terms of like my diet and lifestyle. Yes. Okay. But I didn't, um, I didn't understand the comorbidities that came with a connective tissue disorder yet and mm -hmm. how it might make things easier for me to have access to care for those core mobility comorbidities to have that confirmed connective tissue disorder yes um so we we left his office and then um this was this was after my son was born so this was 2016 when i was first referred to eds and then i i carried on i was functioning well i was working as many hours as i wanted to be working as a mother yeah. i was doing every, I was fulfilling every role that I saw myself being in. Um, and then I had my daughter, things were going great. Again, I thrived during pregnancy. Um, my immunologist thinks it might have been sort of that my immune system was calmed down during that time. And maybe my mast cell activation was a bit different during, during my pregnancies yes. that I was really, I was really able to thrive uh, during yeah. my pregnancies, I had so much energy. I didn't need as much sleep. Um, I could stand. I had standing tolerance for the first time ever. So I just, I loved standing. Um, so people were always offering me chairs everywhere I was. And I was like, eight <laughs> months pregnant with these big bellies and just like, nope, I'm comfortable <laughs> here. Um, so after my daughter was born, the, the postpartum flare, which we were expecting, we learned to sort of expect when my symptoms were going to flare. So we could plan for these things like okay uh, this unexpected thing has happened we need you to give everything you've got here we're going to plan for your recovery after yeah so we we knew that some days I was going to have less energy than others some days I was going to be in more pain than others but it, it never really impacted my functioning I was always able to do whatever I wanted to do but I would be in pain and I would be tired afterwards um and then after my daughter was born, I started having muscle spasms in my hands at first. So I would be cooking, I'd be doing dishes, I'd be snapping the little snaps on our pajamas, and my hands would seize. Um, and just, they'd cramp up, it'd be these really cramp painful cramps for about a minute, and then they, they would loosen up. Mm -hmm. And I'd had those in the past, just very isolated incidents. If I had been doing a sewing project all day, by the end yeah. of the day, I'd get one of those hand cramps and, ooh, okay, yeah. time to stop. Yeah. But this was now happening consistently whenever I was using my hands at arm's reach. So if I keep my, I keep my hands tucked in and close to my body, I don't have that, that same issue. But if I'm, if I'm 
out at arm's reach doing dishes, dressing, um, driving, um, that is when I'll, I'll have the muscle spasms. Mm -hmm. So um, my daughter was about six months old when the um, spasm started in my hands. A few months later, the spasms started in my legs. And when they started in my legs, I stopped driving. Right. Um, and then it progressed to this twitch that I would get in the evenings where I was always looking over my shoulder. Um, and it was actually the, was a, there was a running joke about it at the dinner table because it would happen often in the evenings. So my little girl would always look around at like, what's mommy <sighs> trying to see? So she would always turn her head thinking that there was an activity going on right. at the other side of the kitchen that she wasn't privy to. And like, oh, what's mommy looking at? Um, wow, but that's really scary. And you yeah, really yeah. Um, and then that progressed. I I had an, I got a new neurologist. He seemed really interested. He was, he was a nice guy. Um, he seemed really invested in my story. We did an EMG on my hands at first. It came back negative and he was like, let's do an MRI. Got the MRI done. We're waiting for the results. And then there was this huge cataclysm of stresses in our household where um, I was in a job that was managerial and I didn't really understand how being a manager would take over everything despite it being a nine to five job I wasn't able to put in those boundaries mm -hmm. um, because the, the expectation from my supervisors was that I would be available on my days off that I would be available in the evenings yeah. um, so and so pressure, yeah and so I, I recognized that this wasn't good for me yeah. I changed jobs but there was an overlap so I worked through the holidays and my new job was starting right after the holidays. So I worked through the holidays and I worked that first week totally overlapped. And then at the end of that week, I ended up with gastro. At the end of that week, I ended up with an ear infection. And then uh, about three days later, my, um, I took the day off work. I, I, had, I had made a day off in my new schedule so that I could keep the kids home. I yeah. really wanted just that extra time where it was just us because I felt like I was giving everything my all at work. And then I was coming home and I wasn't present for even those like two hours that we had together before they went to bed. So when I, in changing jobs, I found a part-time um, job so that I could have that extra day at home during the week, just the three of us. Um, yeah. And we could have that connection when there were, where there were no weekend expectations of visiting other people and things. Yeah. So we landed on that day. And um, I decided to stay home. And when you're home alone all day, you don't speak very much. My partner knew that I was staying home. He let me sleep in. He brought the kids to daycare. And then as he came home in the evening, there was a huge snowstorm. So he's dragging the kids home and I'm trying to like pump myself up to get the kids going. And I decided to call my sister while making dinner. And I'm calling my sister and I, I just I kept stuttering and stuttering and stuttering. And then... Um, my partner came home and I was trying to speak and the words just weren't coming out at all. And then as they would come out, I was getting these associated movements. So my arms were curling in and flexing. My head kept moving. I was getting all of these. You could see the tendons pulling in my neck as I was trying to, to speak. Yes. And so we dropped everything. My sister came over to watch the children. We, we flew off to the ER and I wound up in front of a neurologist who was amazing. Um, and he spent hours filling out this paperwork to get these tests done for me because he, he picked it up immediately. He thought that I had a paroxysmal movement disorder so that I had an episodic movement disorder yes. that was mediated by an autoantibody, but not all of the autoantibodies that mediate movement disorders are known. Um, and so he, we flew off and, and did these tests and it came back with the most arbitrary result that we could have gotten, um, which was really frustrating um, in that there was an antibody against my cerebellar tissue, mm -hmm. but they don't know, they didn't identify it. It wasn't one of the ones that he had asked for. Oh gosh. So they didn't identify it. And I don't even know if they would be able to identify yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I have, I now have this cerebellar antibody. Right. And so 
from there, I went back to my functional medicine practitioner and I said, they don't know what to do with me. Let's yes. on a whole bunch of tests and, um, and get me referred to places. And so my functional medicine practitioner was able to get me referred to immunology where they found that I had an um, antibody deficiency. So um, I have about half the antibodies that I should just circulating in my bloodstream. And I have about half the antibodies that should be lining your membranes. So you have, you have antibodies that are just kind of there in your nose and your gut that take care yes. of whatever bacteria on the way. And then you have the system in your blood that yes. takes care of whatever gets in. Yeah. Um, so have I have about half of that. Wow. So that's, yeah, and why I, you, that's why you were getting so many infections and. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So it was actually an incidental finding. We were trying to figure out something else. And, yeah. um, and another thing that was interesting in that is that um, I don't have all of the immunizations aren't all covered in my system either. So I've been immunized for everything throughout my life. Yes. Um, it, and we've even gotten extra vaccines because I was so sickly. My doctor was just like, let's, let's give her like all of the meningitis ones and all of the hepatitis ones mm. just to cover our bases. And I, I only responded to about half of those vaccines. Wow. Yeah. So now I'm on an immune replacement therapy. Okay. So I, um, I have plasma donors from the States. The plasma gets shipped to be processed in Europe and then is, is shipped back to Canada. Um, and there's a, I take five small vials per week through a subcutaneous infusion. Um, so I just little needle in my belly that you would expect to hurt, but doesn't hurt at all. Um, and uh, I do that twice a week. And oh. five vials represents something like anywhere between like five and 10,000 donors. So wow. it's, yeah, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of goodwill to be, yeah. you know, infusing into yourself, um, yes. every week, which, um, and I have like a whole gratitude practice associated with like yeah, doing my infusions absolutely. and things as well. Um, Gosh, Laura, what a journey. I'm just like, I'm just blown away by this. I had, yeah. I had no yeah. idea that you were, you've been through all of this. This is just mm -hmm. so, wow. And so landing in the, in the immune deficiencies clinic, this is where we sort of get to where our system is working. Yes. Is that I landed in this immune deficiencies clinic and I now have this beautiful nurse who if I phone her at, if I leave a message on her voicemail, she will call me back the next day and we can problem solve together. Yes. And then um, I, with the movement disorder, we kind of, we reached a standstill with that weird autoantibody and the neurologist that I was, that was in charge of my case, didn't know what to do with it either. And so um, they sent me to a diagnostic clinic that I had asked for. Um, and I was hoping that that diagnostic clinic could diagnose me with EDS. Um, but I got to the diagnostic clinic. She agreed that I have all the symptoms of EDS, but she wanted to refer me to genetics. So I got another, uh, okay, I got so my genetics right. referral there. And okay. she also referred me to a movement disorders clinic. Right. So now I'm part of this movement disorders clinic and I have a nurse. Right. So when I have, when I have this intense episode of my movement disorder or I, there's something out of the ordinary, I have a new symptom or my symptoms are, I'm not able to control them in the way that I, I have been. Yes. I can call my nurse Yeah. and I can say, wow. Hey, here's what's going on. Yeah. And I can get a response either. Okay. We're going to need to, um, we're going to need to make an appointment with your doctor yeah. versus um, versus like here, why don't you try this? Yeah. And how do you think having this support has helped you manage your symptoms? How important has that support network been for you? So in the last, in about the last like six months or so, I've really taken time to consider how stress impacts my functioning overall. Yes. Absolutely. really think having that network that you know is available for you just yeah. takes that stress away. So yeah. the other best experience that I had with the medical system was that my daughter was born through the midwifery service here. So 
that we have our sort of family medicine that can take care of your pregnancies, your obstetrics and gynecology, or the midwifery program. Right. And the midwifery program here is really exclusive. It's very small. And the, the demand is actually pretty low. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to get in for my second pregnancy. And again, they were on call. I had a pager number. And just the calm that came with yeah. that pager number yeah. was extraordinary just for my health throughout my pregnancy and my mental health throughout my pregnancy. Yes. So like in my first pregnancy, if there was something out of the ordinary, I had to go to the ER. Mm. And so the stress of being mm. in that environment and yes. being treated as though you're sick when you just really, you're a pregnant woman who's pregnant for the first time and has a question. Yes. But in order to answer that question, the only way you can access it is calling our like helpline and having them say, oh, you're a pregnant woman, you need to go to the ER because the yeah. health line sort of defaults to, to yes. that setting. So to have that pager number, I think I used it twice. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's, it's also having that understanding that just because that service exists, it's not necessarily going to be abused. Yes. Um, and I think there's, there's a disconnect there. I think that like decision makers may be thinking that if I had access to my primary physician at all times, if I could email him at all times, which I, I wouldn't argue for, like he needs to have his work-life balance as sure. well. But that if I had access to that healthcare at all times that I would be abusive of it. Yeah. But I so far have not had that experience where having the number has made me want. Sure. Yeah. It's just reassuring. To call them every day. Yeah. It's the reassurance, mm -hmm. I think. And the, like you say, it takes away the stress. And stress has such a detrimental effect on everyone, you know, not just if you've got other underlying conditions. And I think just knowing that someone is there, if you need them, that is a leveler. I think it really, really does help. Absolutely. And that's where I think that's a change that needs to be made for connective tissue disorders mm -hmm. and, and autoimmune conditions. There's those systemic conditions where right now we're spread out in so many different specialists. Yes. Having that one place that we can come back to and that person who's available. So yeah. if, with midwifery, for example, I was assigned to two midwives and one of them was always on duty. Yeah. yeah. So having it split between a few people who know your case. Yes. And so do you think that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you? And obviously, I had no idea that you had such a vast journey that you've been on. But um, is that what one of the changes you think could help the management of chronic illness in, you know, maybe EDS or chronic illness, other, you know, that other people are struggling with? What Absolutely. Do you think, is that what you think could help? Most. Yeah, having having either like a nurse practitioner or any mm. other sort of case manager who can help yeah. you manage the different specialties that you're seeing and different specialties that you need to be seeing and yes. help you prioritize things. Yeah. Um, like my my sort of ideal would be sort of a waiting list resource. Mm -hmm. So a center that you can go to when you're stuck on a waiting list. So um, like the UK and Canada, we have the public system. And yeah. so the waiting lists are extensive. Um, I've, I've never not gotten a test that I needed, but there is, there's a lot of paperwork that goes into some of the tests that yeah. have been done for me. And it's taken a, quite a few special and dedicated doctors to fill out the paperwork for me. Yeah. And I've had to pay for the functional medicine practitioner to really connect me where I needed to go. Yeah because he had that time to listen. Yes, yeah. So sort of having that functional medicine approach doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be paying, that the government system needs to be paying this physician. Having a educated nurse who has time mm -hmm. and who knows your case and is yeah. available. Yes. Really need. Yeah. Um, so I know that's actually something in, in our system that is changing for autism that parents, once they are referred, so not once they get the diagnosis, once the referral is made, they're being put in touch with an, um, it's a intervenant pivot, so a pivot, a pivotal interventionist, I guess. So it's an educator that works with the family during that time of transition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
And that's exactly what we need mm. is that during that, if, if I'm sick enough for you to have ordered the expensive MRI, I'm sick enough to be eligible for services. Yes. So just having that connection that can, wh whether it's you've done the test and it's come back with no results, but you still have those symptoms that are yeah. limiting to you, or whether you're just waiting for that test to be done, just having someone who can be central and who mm -hmm. knows you. Yes. Who can connect you to services. Yeah. Would be. Very, yeah. Very good idea. And, yeah. and it's available for other illnesses. Yeah. So my movement disorder, I have that service. My primary immune deficiency, I have that service. If I had a nurse who was responsible for me, I would be freeing up those two nurses for other patients who only had those conditions. Yeah. So now, yeah. now you're paying two nurses to take care of my case. You could yeah. be paying one nurse to yeah. take care of my case. Yeah. So there's, there's also that sort of, there are funding benefits to it. Yes. And I have gone to the ER once this past um, year. I mean, the, the health climate of the world has influenced that. Nobody sure. wants to go to the ER right now if they can help yeah. it. But yeah. In the past year since I've had access to my nurses, I haven't needed to go to the ER because I'm not, mm. I'm not scared that nobody's going to take me seriously if they don't see me at my worst. Yes. So my, my symptoms get really bad in the evening. So I spent so many nights in the ER because my, I would get to my neurology appointments during the day and they would see this. Yeah. They'd see this healthy young woman and we'd show them the videos and it, the videos had an impact, but, um, yeah. Not the same impact as the on-call neurologist coming in and seeing me in spasm. So it was it was having these spasms in yes. like in the emergency room on the chairs in front of everyone else who's got like broken thumbs and you know. Oh, but that's so yeah. It's so kind but of it's sad, a huge it? yeah. But it would be a huge money saver to have sure just this um, resource available for us. We yeah. wouldn't need we wouldn't be so desperate. <laughs> Um, if we had these resources available and it, mm. I think it would be a huge cost saving measure in the long run as well. Yes. And yes. then there's so many things that you can do to build anyone's health, just in terms of movement, of quality of sleep, um, yeah. of stress management techniques and yes. community or a network that they're connected to, yeah. um, and helping them do that. Those determinants of health, it doesn't matter what your diagnosis is. Yeah. So yeah. we could be working from that preventative side yes. in sort of a waiting list resource type thing. So yeah. that would be, that would be my, my absolute dream. I've started the process of applying to do graduate work in looking at the role of occupational therapy yes. in, um, in intervening at that point in someone's oh, health good. journey. So oh, intervening good. from that first point. So I, I, give a lecture at the occupational therapy school that I went to um, annually where I talk about my access to the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge wake up call for the students who are still in this like idealistic world before they get out into what working in healthcare really looks like. Yes. Um, and so when I explained to them that I saw a, um, I saw my first physical therapist and occupational therapist and speech and language pathologist that were publicly funded. I saw them for the first time this past September, which was 18 months after my symptoms started. Um, that is a long time. <laughs> and long time. Um, I cannot speak highly enough of the therapists that I've worked with, especially over the last 18 months. Yeah. So what do you do now? Yeah, so to help, um, help your I see it, Yeah, I see a, I saw a speech and language pathologist first. Yeah. Uh, because of course that was something that was incredibly distressing not being able to communicate when I had a 14 month old at home and a 3 year old at home. That was that was very mm -hmm. distressing. Um and my speech therapist really focused on that aspect of it. So in her recommendations, she sent me this whole list of, of exercises to do, um, but her recommendations, the highlighted ones, were make sure that you spend time connecting with your partner. 
find ways that you can continue to connect with your children in the same way that you were three weeks ago. So finding audiobooks to go with their favorite stories mm-hmm. and sitting there and doing those with them and like making sure that even though I couldn't sing them their lullaby, I was putting it on the phone and I was carrying out that routine anyway. Um, so those, she made sure that I was reconnecting with those things that I felt like I had lost mm-hmm. and I didn't have to ask her for that she brought that to me and it was it's sort of outside the sphere necessarily of what you would think for a speech and language pathologist um but she had been in the field so long that she really she saw what i was missing she listened to my story and she was able to give me that feedback and really put it as the top priority that it's going to be a long time before you have control over your voice again and we don't know how this is going to play out because of the stress of the movement disorder and the, because of the stress of the um, of not being able to communicate, the first episodes lasted a very long time. So now I'll get sort of episodes in the evening and by the morning I'll be fine. Or Stop. even on, on a really hard day, I'll get an episode midday and by the morning I'll be fine. So is this happening every day still or is it? Now it comes in waves. So I'm, I'm still learning the pacing. And yes. I, think, I think this happens to everybody with chronic illness. And it's, it's something that, um, that we all struggle with is that boom bust mm-hmm. of I feel good. Yeah. I have so many things that I want to do. I have so many people that I want to connect with. I'm going to do it all. And then you have that, sure. that coming down. You have the flare. Yeah. And then you have to t- sort of try to find the right, yes. the right path. Um, and so you what happens a, now? You have this system though, don't you? Yes, yeah, so um, this was- so This unique system you've created. So it's actually something that I borrowed from, uh, something that I saw online years and years ago when I was first Googling EDS. There's a company called Stickman Communications. Oh, yes. Well, that I think are based Anna. in the UK. Yeah. Hannah, Hannah Enser, yeah. who's part of the HMSA. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she, communications. I, yeah, I, I just actually recently checked out her website yesterday just to make sure that I was getting the, uh, the name correct. And it's, it's expanded so much since last time I was there. Um, yeah. But she had these bracelets that you could wear to indicate good day, medium yes. day, bad day. And yeah. I thought that was a great idea. Um, but in our house, I've got my son who also has hypermobility and some other like developmental, um, delays, and he's quite a rigid little fellow. So when we started thinking about, okay, how can we communicate my energy level to the kids? Mm -hmm. Thought about using those visual cues, but because he's so rigid, we thought that if he saw green on my wrist, he'd make these associations right away. And because my condition is so fluid, um, we really wanted him to learn the skill that he would have to check in with me regardless of what he's seeing on the outside. Mm -hmm. Wanted him to learn that he needs to ask me how I'm doing and it needs to be a a back and forth and a discussion because he'll he'll take that cue and he'll run with it. He's the kind of kid who, um, you know, we brought his birthday cake to preschool and his um in the morning they always have fruit for snack and we had brought the birthday cake in the morning so we brought this beautiful birthday cake we blew out the candles we offered him a cupcake and he didn't want it because he has fruit for snack in the morning but then in the afternoon when it's the treat snack he was all over it but he really (laughs) he just he loves those he loves those strict associations he loves that he loves that control which i think a lot of people with hypermobility do because yes. there's so much that we're trying to navigate. Yes. Anything that we, anything that can be predictable is just, is nice. You get attached yeah. to those, those Absolutely. routines. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm seeing it play out in this little guy. And so I needed a way to explain to them um, how I was feeling and what we could do in association with how I was feeling. So we came up with this battery system where mama has small batteries. So to differentiate me from their father or their aunt or the other like caregivers in their life. um, I have small batteries. So my batteries need to be recharged a lot. 
-hmm. And here are the different ways that mama recharges her batteries. And so they see that I rest a lot. They see that my medication takes a lot of time and I can only do it at specific times of day because I have to do it when I'm at my best. Um, so sometimes that means that mama has the door closed and she's doing her medicine. Um, and so they see all these things that I do to, to refill my batteries and we have mama has low batteries and mama's batteries are up. So when mama has low batteries, that means that we can do quiet activities. Mm -hmm. And that we set up the activities that we can do. We can watch a movie. Mom can sit with you while you play a game. Mom can sit with you reading books. Yes. Um, you know, when, I, when I'm bad enough that I really need to be alone, the door is closed and uh, the other people who are caring for them really do their best to make sure that they're not, um, yeah. you know, that they're feeling connected. Yes. Um, but otherwise, I do try to be as involved as I can, even on, on the tough days. So I have um, an augmented communication app on my phone. So I have, um, I have these phrases that are just um, sort of built right into my home screen. You can't see with the, the backlight. But yeah. so the first one is my voice is weird. So that's how the kids communicate that I can't speak. Is, oh, mama's voice is weird. Oh, okay. So they know right away. I can just click on that button. My voice is weird. And, uh, yeah. and they'll know right away. And, um, I have all the little, like, I love you twos and all things like programmed right into here. And I even have a like full page of like preschool dirty words where we just say bum bum and farts and <laughs> all sorts of things and make jokes with each other at the table. Oh. Um, what so we we've, like worked that into like low battery. Yeah. Um, and when mama's batteries are up, they know that we have a whole different set of activities that are open for us. So we can do baking and we can play on the floor together and we can do an arts and crafts project. Um, but they also know that after that, we have to plan something that is more restful for mama. Yes. So we yes. do make a schedule of our day also that my children love that predictability we sit down after breakfast every day and we make a visual schedule of what are we going to do today. So we have the things that are set in stone. So we have our meals that are set in stone. We know that we want to go outdoors at least once a day. We, we know that we want to do our videos at least once a day. And, um, and we know that we do a little bit of like table school work yeah. when we're home. What a um, brilliant idea. Yeah. And so but we put that together and we have sort of, this is taking, this is going to take a lot of mommy's energy. So the next yeah. one we're going to plan is something that is more restful for her. Yeah. Wow. Um, the schedule. And also that my son can learn that we do something that we love and is motivating and exciting, but we do need to take the time to, yeah. to slow down because he's already, he's already dealing with chronic pain and yes. Um, we want them having those tools very yeah. early to learn how to manage yeah. that. Well, it's great for him, isn't it? Because he's learning through everything you've set up through this. He's an adorable little advocate. Like it's, oh. it's really cute. Um, we call it his bendy body because he, he has overt hypermobility. Like there's no, I don't think I was even that flexible as a child. Like I don't have memories of being as, as floppy yes. as he is. And yes. he has a, he does have a gross motor developmental delay associated with this hypermobility right. um, because his, his proprioception is pretty, is pretty low. Right. Um, and you can tell that like, you know, he put him in water and it is a different experience, but then he also has dysautonomia that goes along with it. So you see him in his, well, this was, you know, when we were still going to, to do more community activities, but you'd see him in the pool and all the little kiddos would be sitting along the side waiting for their turn to go for their swim. And you'd see four little kids having a great time and this little boy just turning blue and shivering in the shallow Aww. end of this heated pool. Oh, so bless. he didn't he didn't love it. So <laughs> finding the uh it's Find, finding the balance. Finding what's right for him, yeah. So what um obviously your journey has been, you know, so vast. There might be you know, people obviously, we're all different and people might be listening who can relate to your journey, maybe not all of it, but certainly the difficulty you've had, you know, and still trying to find answers, but you've come a long, long way, which is brilliant. So do you have any advice for people who might be struggling, who might be 
starting off on their own personal journey right now? I think one of the things that's really bolstered me through the process is I've made quite a number of sort of social media and online friends and even people, other people with chronic illnesses who live in my city, but we can't connect physically mm -hmm. because of our limitations. Yes. Um, and the support that we are able to give each other that is so non-judgmental and that really understands what it is we're going through on, on a day to day and where, where I might be hesitant to text my sister who is a huge role in our life and it is really instrumental in in balancing like our, our child care and my health um and I, it's hard to text her and explain to her exactly what's going on with my bladder retention yeah and just not overwhelming her with oh god what does this mean for me because she has such a huge role in our lives and even my partner like coming home and being like i have a new symptom and it's not in a specialty that I'm already seen by. Yeah. So just like divulging that information to your care team and your family is, is really, it's heavy because it weighs on them as well. It's a whole new set of appointments that we're going to have to go to. It's yes. a new therapist who's going to be coming into our home. It's, um, I do actually a lot of my therapy at home, which I love. Yeah. Um, it's so it's so great, it's, especially like this Zoom stuff has been amazing. Yes. Just being oh, able to great. do therapy here without having to go to my therapist's office downtown Absolutely. is oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but so it's it's inviting new people into our home. It's going to new specialties. It's a whole new round of testing and um, a whole new round of maybe like procedures or medication trials and things like ooh. Yeah. So, but having someone who knows your story who knows that full weight of it, but is going through it themselves. When you yeah. say like, oh, I think I just lost another system. And you can, you can express that without having that weight of them having to carry any of it for you. Yeah. Absolutely. You carry each other's stories a little bit. You care about them. You ask about the appointments. But it, it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day burden yeah. hearing what's going on with my friends and their illnesses. I don't feel like I'm putting any, sharing my story and sharing my symptoms and what's going on for me day to day. I don't feel like that's adding to their burden yes. and them sharing their stories with me. It's not adding to my burden. I yeah. care for them and I'm going to ask after them and I'm going to follow up, Yeah. but it's not the same as sharing it with the people who are actively taking care of you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so it's a really, really nice outlet where you don't have to be afraid of like surprising people or having them not believe you either. So when, when you text someone and you're like, I am pretty sure I just dislocated a rib. They're not like, you didn't dislocate a rib. They're like, yeah. Oh, cool. How? Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, how are you feeling? Do you need to go to the ER? Like, let's check which ER is busiest today. Yeah. Or yeah. like, Oh, this is an ortho. Isn't your ortho at this hospital versus that hospital? And like, because they know, yeah. Um, because they know there's, there's a lightness to it, yeah, which is, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah, really important. Mm -hmm. and, I think and so I've, I've connected with total strangers. I found women with EDS and paroxysmal dyskinesia on Instagram and I've sent them messages and they have, they have been very vocal about their disability where I, I haven't posted videos of my, my episodes or anything online, mm -hmm. though I am quite open about it. Um, but they've been brave enough to post these videos online yeah. and tag them, hashtag paroxysmal dyskinesia and be, yeah. be available to find. So yeah. I found them and I messaged That's them brilliant. and I said, like, thank you. This, I was able to show my kids this video yeah. of you, like taking pauses during an art project while you navigated your muscle spasms. And that was really meaningful for me. Yeah. Um, and it was really meaningful for my kids to be able to yeah. see, oh, they look like mummy. Yeah. And like going in and seeing other people's Instagrams where they're out in the parks with their mobility aids and things, just knowing that that community is out there and don't be afraid to just reach out and talk say, to them. Yeah. And it takes um, the fear away, doesn't it? Because maybe as a youngster, seeing somebody having a spasm or an episode can be quite scary, you know, and then 
Yeah, I surprise a lot of people on public transit yeah. <laughs> because because I just end up looking over my shoulder often. Oh. I'll end up like staring right in someone's face, just being like, sorry, oh. <laughs> muscle spasm um, as soon as it's over. No, but, but it's, uh, I mean, yeah. technology is great that we can connect. And, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast, you know, uncovering the truth. You know, what what are people living with on a daily basis that people, doctors don't know about, you know, then like we've just discussed, um, <laughs> raising that awareness so people don't judge and don't think we're making it up and don't, you know, just because we look like this, we don't always look like this, you know. So, That's been a big chorus with the mothers that I've connected with as well, is yeah. that our kids aren't going to grow up with that gaslighting. Yeah. They are going yeah. to have their pain acknowledged from the moment they were able to express it. Yeah. They are going to learn management strategies that don't involve them being told that they're faking it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't feel like I was ever overtly told that I was making anything up. I, but I was told that I was exaggerating. Yeah. And something that happened a lot as a child is my parents would see me using my illness to get out of things I didn't like. But like now I'm able to explain to them, I wasn't using my illness to get out of things I didn't want to do. I was ignoring my illness to do the things I wanted to do. Mm. It was in fact the opposite. And yeah. my baseline probably should have been doing less than I did, but I pushed through because I was, I was motivated yeah. and it was nice for me to have that balance where I was able to retreat from the things that weren't important to me. Yeah. Um, and I do hope it to offer that to my son under that lens. Yeah. Yeah. We can let go of the things that aren't important to us. Absolutely. We have to play the game a little bit. Like you're going to have to go to PE class. You're going to have to do, um, yeah. You know, you're going to have to take subjects that you're not interested in and things, but we can let go of the things that aren't, aren't helping, that aren't, uh, that we aren't motivated to do. Yeah, absolutely. And the things that stress us, right? Because we talked yeah. about how, how stress can have such a big impact on our lives. Absolutely. Um, so get rid of the stress, you know, get rid of the stuff and the people, sadly, people that don't serve you well. Sometimes we have to say goodbye to people and things and jobs that mm -hmm. aren't serving us well, I'm afraid. Um, but it's, it's a necessary thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Other thing for me that's been instrumental is just reading. Just, I've been, since, since that episode where my speech went, I've been reading so many books about health. So I've been reading like Period Power by Maisie Hill to help learn how to manage my energy and expectations around my cycle mm -hmm. and applying that to managing my energy and expectations around my pacing that is linked with my chronic illness, not necessarily with my hormones. Yes. Um, and then reading a book called Make Time that's these two Silicon Valley guys who are telling you how to create time in the day for things that are important to you. They're mm -hmm. using a different lens and yeah. they're, they're really talking about work and productivity yeah. But I can take the lessons that they're learning and I can apply them to, okay, what is the highlight for me? The highlight for me might not be a project at work, but the highlight for me, I can still use these same strategies Absolutely. to manage my time yeah. and to manage my distractions and my energy. Yeah. Um, and I've been reading um, The Body Keeps the Score and trying to understand yes. a little bit more about how how trauma is affecting my neurological yeah um my neurological system and how yeah. i can address that with different modalities yeah and i'm working with my, my therapist on that as well yeah so just keep keep reading anything that you can get your hands on that really speaks to where you're trying to go even if it's not necessarily directly about your condition yeah absolutely there are still things yeah. that you can take nothing is a rule no, no. nothing you so um diet is a huge thing for me and i've tried every like standardized autoimmune and, and um and anti-inflammatory diet that there is and yes. i've now settled on my diet and it doesn't have to have a name it doesn't have to have rules um it's just yeah. the things that are supporting me personally so yeah. you don't have to subscribe to one way of doing things but explore all sorts of different ways and keep experimenting yeah and I think that's really key, isn't it? It's not what it's there's not going to be one thing 
that, that makes it all better. It is going to be a bit of this, a bit of that. And it all goes into the mixing pot. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what works for you, which will be different to what works for somebody else. Um, and I think it's having confidence as well. I think, you know, living with these illnesses gives you, you have to develop confidence to try different things. Oh, that mm-hmm. didn't work. That wasn't for me, but I'm going to try this. Don't, I think, don't give up and keep looking for what works for you. Um, so, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Gosh, thank you so much for sharing. What, what a journey. What a yeah, journey I've been, been looking for ways to join the conversation. I, yeah. I do have a bit of an exceptional story in that I have a number of rare conditions. Yes. So putting all those three together is really hard to do and tease them away yeah. from each other. But I, my story is so familiar to so many people. Yes. Um, and that's what's driving me to to go back to school as well. I I know that I can't be the person on the front lines, but I feel like an academic context is something mm-hmm. that's going to be able to support me yeah. as I prove that these services are needed and Absolutely. let that be my contribution. Definitely. That's amazing. That's an awesome contribution. I mean, gosh, you're going to help so many people. Um, oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story with our listeners. I hope everyone listening found that, um, well, it was fascinating, I think, because, you know, Laura's been so resilient, so determined, so strong. Gosh, and just amazing. And so, you know, thank you so much. And, and I hope that everything continues to go in the right direction for you and you get more answers and your, you know, your genetics testing that you're waiting for gives you the answers that you're you're looking for and um but yeah if you have any questions um for laura um leave us a comment down below um and i'll make sure laura sees the question um but just let us know any thoughts did did uh, laura's story resonate with you in any way um but thank you everyone for listening to this episode of finding your range and thank you again laura for joining us and thank um, you for having me Jeannie. No, no, it's been our pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for being so honest and open with us. And um, so thank you again, everyone. And um, until next time, keep moving.